Um, welcome everybody to uh, another um, edition of, of Pairs uh, via Zoom. Um, we are very lucky this evening to have uh, Dr. Sandeep Bagla with us. Uh, he's uh, given many presentations, I'm sure several of you have seen him at SIR. Um, and he's joining us this evening to talk about geniculate artery embolization, his experience, the development of his practice, um, and so forth. For everybody uh, that's been on before, we're gonna do the same sort of Q&A session at the end. So if any questions come up during the meeting, feel free to put them in the Q&A session uh, and we'll go over those at the end. Uh, without further ado, Sandeep, you can go ahead. Great, you can hear me okay, right? Yes. All right, perfect. So uh, by the way, thank you folks for the invitation too. Uh, really honored to speak. I came to Philadelphia to speak at the society meeting uh, years ago and I remember uh, coming there and hanging out with Tim Clark for the evening, who, who definitely grilled me on some very difficult questions. So uh, it's good to come back and speak about GAE. So I sort of put together a slide deck on some data, some practical tips on doing the procedure, and then a little bit of anatomy. So I'm going to go through really just the role of genicular artery embolization and, and, and why, how, and what the results are. These are uh, my disclosures. And so obviously, everybody knows how big of a problem knee arthritis is. Um, you know, 30 million people in the United States are affected by knee osteoarthritis. I think these are the more staggering figures, though, more than 100,000 NSAID-related GI toxicity admissions, which are primarily related to pain. And so I think that's important. And then there's 16,000 estimated NSAID-related deaths just in arthritis patients alone. And for those of you who are big on uh, data and, 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 and clinical trials and level one evidence, I always find this statistic really shocking. There's more than 4 million knee injections performed annually, which include steroid and synvisc injections, but there are double-blind randomized control studies that show that neither of these actually work for any long-term, and yet there are millions of them done every year. The rationale for GAE is really that there's an underlying synovial inflammation that occurs early on in osteoarthritis. There's stimulation of release of certain cytokines like IL-1, IL-6, and vascular endothelial growth factor that leads to an angiogenesis in the synovium. Those cytokines also lead to uh, degeneration of the cartilage, osteophyte formation and neovascularity, and then subsequently leads to an increase in pain fibers in the synovium and leads to pain. This has been well established. This is not a new actual description of, of synovitis, angiogenesis in the setting of osteoarthritis. Traditionally in, in radiology education, of course, they, they talk about OA being primarily a degenerative disease, but actually the first two stages of OA are primarily inflammatory. And this has been described, this is 15 years ago in the Journal of Rheumatology where they actually outlined these actual cytokines that get released and how they affect cartilage, uh, angiogenesis, um, and osteophyte formation. So it's not a new phenomenon. Um, there have been multiple clinical trials to date, and I'll, I'm gonna go through these you know, sequentially, but. In 2015, we described a series of 13 patients who had hemoarthrosis after knee arthroplasty in the Journal of Arthroplasty, but it wasn't until later that year where Dr. Okuno, Yuji Okuno, described his first 14 patients uh, piloting in the setting of arthritis and not hemoarthrosis. He followed this up in 2017 with a 72, 72 patient study. And again, I'll go through these in more detail. Uh, Lee et al. In, in, in Asia also followed with a retrospective study of four, 41 patients. And then we published here the first US study on OA in 20 patients, um, which I'll go through as well. So these are the studies that are to date. What's nice about giving a lecture like this is there's not much clinical research. You don't have to, you don't have to dig really deep in PubMed to find all the data that's necessary to present. So I'm gonna start with the Okuno study in 2017 because he really took the subset from his 2015 study and included it in this 2017 study. So it's a repeated subset. Um, but the 72 patients are comprehensive. So he took 72 patients, 95 knees. They had kellegren lorentz grading scale, one to three. It's a four-stage grading scale for OA, one to four, with four being basically complete loss of cartilage and almost ankylosis of the joint. They were refractory to medication, and they were followed up at one, four, six, 12, and 24 months. Interestingly, in these patients, they use imipenem silostatin, which is primaxin in the United States, antibiotic, which if you're not familiar with, in, in Japan and in Asia, this antibiotic, which is basically a, a soluble salt solution, is used as a temporary embolic in the setting of GI bleeds. It's used in multiple situations, 
but he chose to use this in the setting of MSK embolization. In a small subset, only seven of these patients, they used a permanent embolic embozine, 75 micron in size. But the majority of these patients were actually treated with intra-arterial injection of an antibiotic, uh, which is important to note. Their technical success, um, they, one, which they defined as at least one artery embolized, and their clinical success, a 50% decrease, and this is a Western Ontario scale, which basically looks at disability, pain, and physical function at six months. Um, well, 50% decrease was considered a, a clinical success. And if you look at, at their success rates, and it's blacked out, I'm sorry, but at, at two years, their success rate was roughly 80%. So 80% of patients roughly had a clinical success at two years after embolization, which is a very staggering result actually in this, in this patient population. And when they looked at MRI findings in this patient population, there were no advancements of degenerative arthritis in these patients, no decrease in synovial thickness, no worsening of osteophyte formation, and no worsening of synovitis scores. So from a, from a study standpoint, it, it was very impressive. This is what that Womax scale is. It's a standardized orthopedic scale, which looks like I mentioned is pain, stiffness, and physical function. Unfortunately, physical function and pain are primarily affected by the contralateral knee. And one thing we found in, in our clinical study is that although you can, assess, you can assess a patient's pain, unfortunately, you can't really always assess the index knee. The contralateral knee may be, may be just as important in assessing their physical function. For example, if their right knee is affected and you make them feel much better, it may not overall impact them going up and down stairs. Despite that, the patient still had a very significant improvement. So 80% improvement in two years, which is, which is very significant. This is a breakdown of patients who actually had other conservative therapies before they underwent treatment, whether they were on opioid medication NSAIDs or they had previous hyaluronic injections. And the point is, over time, as you'll see, there's a decrease in the amount of, of subsequent or uh, uh, collateral or adjunctive techniques to really reduce their pain. I think that's one thing that's really important to take away from this is not only are you improving their function, but you're reducing their, their adjunctive techniques that are, that are uh, utilized to improve their pain. So that's important. Um, they did have no major complications. They had 12 access, access site hematomas. There were four patients out of the seven who did receive embozine, which had transient cutaneous changes or ischemia in their skin. No ulcerations in their skin, but they did have transient discoloration. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of cases of that later on. In 2019, uh, out of Asia also, Dr. Lee et al. reported on a retrospective study of 41 patients and 71 knees. I actually find this study, even though it's retrospective and a little bit less in terms of scientific rigor, to be more valuable. I think What's interesting here is they stratified patients uh, from Kellegren Lawrence one to three versus Kellegren Lawrence four. And, and what they found is that if you look at these patients and you compare the mild to moderate cases versus the severe cases, there's a real difference. In the baseline characteristics here, there really is, sorry, let me go back here. There's really no difference. There was no significant difference in their baseline characteristics overall, except for their grading score. But when it came time to actually get treated, and this is an example of their treatment, you can see the white arrows point to the medial side of this knee, for example, which has a significant increased vascularity and synovial blush. This is before embolization on the left and after embolization on the right. You know, what they found here, and this is kind of a busy slide of their data, but if you focus, let me see if I can get this, uh, let me get my uh, arrow here. Let me see if this works. If you guys can see my arrow, that might help. Go back a slide. Uh, here we go. So on here, as you'll probably see here, in the mild to moderate group, which is the first row, okay, if you go down to the VAS or visual analog scale in the second row, as you follow this out at baseline, they're 5.5 out of 10 and out to 12 months, they're down to 1.8. But if you go down here to VAS on the severe group, they start out at 6.3. And although they may get better by one month, they start to regress by 12 months. And I think that's important because early on in Dr. Okuno's experience, what he found in his probably first 100 patients, and I saw some data from him early on, you know, about three, four years ago, is that this is what he found. Later stage patients don't do as well. They might see an early improvement, but they certainly regress by 12 months. And so I think this speaks to the level of inflammation that goes on early versus the level of fibrosis and scarring that may occur late. So I think that's an important uh, uh, concept to, to think about. There were no major complications. Again, temporary skin discoloration, 
Uh, they had a post-procedural fever in one patient. Um, you know, there was one other prospective single center study on 10 patients who included early Kelligren one and two stage patients. Um, again, what's important to realize about this, they had 10 patients in the study, but six patients needed repeat intervention and two patients underwent, uh, withdrawed and under, uh, subsequently underwent knee replacement. Um, they did in this, in this study population use either antibiotic or small particle PVA. Again, here before embolization on the left, uh, after embolization on the right, and you can see the synovial hypervascularity here, uh, uh, here as well. Uh, this is also along the medial side of the joint. So what they also found is, and they utilized different scales, the KOOS scale, the knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome, in, outcome score is well established in the orthopedic world. And they do assess, again, stiffness, pain, function, but they also assess quality of life. So a little bit deeper than say the typical Womack score that they were, were using. Um, and, but they defined responders as pain improvements by at least 20% from baseline, function at least 20% from baseline. Uh, and they looked at a global assessment of they moderately and better or they much better. I think these are probably more practical improvements because when you look at how patients do with pain medicine, most people with pain medicine or joint injections do at least say 20% better. So when you look at this minimal clinically important difference that we're trying to assess in clinical studies, this is probably a more uh, reasonable objective, I think, when it comes to clinical research and knee pain than say, you know, 50% decrease in pain, uh, because that may be a harder benchmark to achieve, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an important quality of life improvement uh, factor for these patients. Uh, when you look at responders, one month, six months, about 70%, 12 months, 60%. But at 24 months, he did not have the same impressive results that, that Okono had, uh, where he had 30% uh, response rate at, at 24 months. There were no major complications, and there was one access uh, side hematoma. Uh, in our clinical study, which was published in JVIR, if you want, would like to refer to it, we did two sites, 20 patients, also Kelligren 1, 2, and 3. This is an example of a case of, uh, of our embolization. You can see the degree of vascularity here, both along the synovium and even adjacent to the tibial plateau or overlying the tibial plateau before and after embolization. In our 20 patients, uh, nine patients underwent embolization with 75 micron embozine and, and 11 patients with 100 micron embozine. In terms of clinical results, if you look at the visual analog score improvement in these patients, it was a very substantial improvement, about 60 to 70% improvement in pain. Uh, which was durable at least to six months, which is what our clinical study was performed to. And if you look at actual function, physical function improved and quality of life improved out to six months as well, similar parallel data pain. Now, in terms of safety and complications, this is an example of what that skin discoloration is. We saw this in 13 patients. It's a patchy skin discoloration. Of course, we picked the worst example to show you because just to make it obvious that it can occur uh, to this degree. What's Actually nice about this skin discoloration is post-procedure, you can assess that the actual discoloration occurs in the area that the patient had palpable tenderness. And that's important because when you're assessing these patients preoperatively, you want to embolize the areas where they actually have pain. And so we actually mark that area on the skin oftentimes preoperatively so that we know, okay, it's not just the medial side of the joint, but the inferior medial side. So we know we're interrogating the right arteries. And then afterwards, you can actually palpate over these areas to make sure that you actually address the right uh, places. You know, our study was a prospective IDE study here in the, in the US and uh, at both UNC Chapel Hill and my site. And uh, there were some minor uh, uh, complications that were associated probably to antibiotics uh, and a small groin hematoma. Um, there were two patients, however, and this is why we switched from 75 micron to 100 micron that had transient plantar numbness. Now, all of our patients went, underwent a very close physical exam afterwards. And of course, this is a study done here in the US as opposed to overseas. So they were followed very closely. Both of these patients who had transient plantar numbness over their, under their great toe, uh, both self-resolved, one at day five and one at day 14. And it was hypothesized that, that both of these cases occurred from presumably non-target embolization to the tibial nerve from these 75 micron particles which is why we actually switched to 100 micron and we subsequently did not see that uh, after the switch. There was a subsequent systematic review that was published. I don't really focus too much on this because there were three papers which we reviewed, um, but they put this together and just published this recently um, with high technical, su uh, technical success rates. Of course, the average VAS did decrease over 12 months, 
Uh, there is a huge difference in follow-up, however, as you, as you saw from these clinical studies. Okino, who follows these patients out to 24 months, us to six months in that study, and Lee to 12 months. So a huge difference uh, in, terms of, in terms of looking at outcomes. The one thing I want to share with you is this clinical study, which we completed and has been submitted for publication. Uh, and so we're pending uh, print for this article, which is our multi-center. It was a randomized sham control study of GAE. And so we completed the study and we included patients who were over 40, moderate or severe knee pain, but they still had to have Kellogren grade one to three, uh, pain greater than uh, 50 on a scale of zero to 100, and they had to be refractory for three months to other therapies. We obviously excluded people who had knee infections, rheumatoid arthritis, previous surgery in the knee, and they had, if they had known angiographic exclusions like SFA occlusions. Um, we screened 30 patients, excluded a small number, 27 were deemed eligible, three declined to participate, one had medical issues, and one had another reason why they declined, and 21 subjects were enrolled. And you can see this was our allocation. So 14 patients, it was a two-to-one allocation, were randomized to GAE, seven were randomized to SHAM. At one month, they were followed up and analyzed. And if they were not any better in the sham group, they were allowed to cross over. So on the right side here, you can see the all seven patients were no better. And they were, they were allowed to cross over to GAE. And actually, they all crossed over and chose to get the GAE. On the other side, 13 patients were analyzed. Uh, they entered the extension period for which we followed them up to 12 months. Okay, So this is exactly how our protocol went. We followed them with a VAS scale and Womack score, which we discussed earlier. These were the baseline characteristics of these patients, and there was no real significant difference between the sham group and the GA group. Um, you'd expect procedure times, fluoroscopy times, and radiation doses to be relatively low. Procedure times, um, you know, overall procedure time uh, is, is, is still relatively short, but I kind of describe this uh, similar to uh, performing, say, a PAE procedure. So since you are selecting two or three, you know, uh, branch vessels off the popliteal and femoral artery, there is some considerable time, I think, just for for selecting multiple vessels. But nonetheless, there were no baseline demographic differences. So in terms of how we do the procedure and in this particular subset, we basically look at the knee and I sort of drew these uh, blue areas of, of, uh, that we use to assess clinically. Does the patient have medial or lateral pain, superior or inferior with respect to the joint line? Once we've identified that, we'll interrogate the three arteries that occur on that side of the joint. So if it's on the medial or lateral side, that's what we determine. But we really want to focus on the target artery. So if it's inferior on the on the lateral side, we're going to target target here the uh, the the uh, inferior lateral genicular artery, which is here, and then the recurrent genicular artery, which is off the anterior tibial artery. If it's on the medial side, similarly, we'll we'll, we'll attack the three arteries on the medial side to assess which has an increased in synovial vascularity. Um, all patients underwent an MRI pre-procedure. Uh, in this particular setting, here's an example of an MRI post-contrast fat suppressed. And you can see here on the axial images, there's areas of increased enhancement overlying the synovium medially. And then similarly on the, on the sagittal view, you can see the extensive enhancement along the synovial lining. And so this is actually utilized not just for confirming that the patient has, has pain in where we think they have pain, but it's also useful because it confirms that the patients have some degree of synovitis. And there are numerous MRI studies with that, that have demonstrated that enhancement in the setting of, um, in the setting of uh, osteoarthritis will, will uh, uh, also be consistent with synovitis. And I think this is something that's really important to, to, to really uh, keep an eye on and pay attention to. So all these patients underwent an MRI, like I mentioned uh, beforehand. In terms of this particular patient, on the non-selected angiogram of just from the femoral artery with our sheath in the femoral artery, what you'll see here is you're not really identifying much uh, en enough early synovial hypervascularity. But what we did in this particular case, because we knew the patient had medial pain is where the arrow is pointing, we selected the superior medial genicular artery. And, and, and you can see here, the angles can be somewhat difficult, of course, from coming down the legs. So these, these, these are the vessels that can frankly make the case a little bit more challenging. I think the superior medial and lateral arteries are probably the most difficult to catheterize, but unfortunately they contribute significantly to the, to the vascular distribution of the knee. And in this particular case, after selecting the artery, this is what we saw. And this was that example earlier that I showed you of the degree of vascularity you see after catheterization. 
In this particular case, we use a 2.0 microcatheter, but uh, suffice to say, in most cases, or I would say almost all cases, we start the cases with 2.4 French microcatheters because despite them being fairly small vessels, we haven't had any real issues with getting 2.4 catheters into the arteries as long as it's over a relatively stable wire. Um, what we're looking for from an endpoint standpoint is this. We're looking for decrease in the vascularity, but we also are looking for preserving these branches that are perpendicular to the genicular artery. So these arteries that extend medially out to the skin, those branches we would like to preserve. There is almost no way of avoiding these branches. We've tried things like ice on the knee uh, to cause vasoconstriction, uh, getting very distal, but oftentimes despite that, even with very slow injections where we're administering 0.2 cc aliquots or very dilute beads, you're still gonna get a small amount of particulate in there, but suffice it to say there's uh, what's comforting, I would say is that uh, even with these skin changes, they're transient. So the nice thing about this is, it, you know, at small doses of embolic, you're not leading to skin ulceration like you could run, say, for example, in hemoarthrosis cases where you need more embolic. Um, this is another example of a more profound uh, advanced osteoarthritic patient. You can see the image on the right is the one from before embolization. On the left is after embolization. Again, you can see the angle of this being sort of a reverse origin from the popliteal artery. Um, and, and there's extensive collateralization in these vessels, which is important, uh, obviously, when doing uh, embolization in the setting, because in this particular case, it's anastomosing with an inferior medial genicular branch. On the right, you can see this fairly well. But, you know, unfortunately, these branches then can backfill the anterior tibial artery or posterior tibial artery or popliteal artery. So with over-injection, you can actually pass beads distally, even though you think you're actually in the genicular artery. So being somewhat careful, I'd say, with respect to, um, uh, um, you know, uh, with respect to paying attention to these collaterals and making sure um, that there is really no uh, unintended non-target embolization. So in our clinical in our clinical study, all procedures are technically successful. There was synovial hypervascularity seen in all cases. Uh, patients excluded after increasing their home medication. So we excluded patients who did at all increase their medication. They were considered failures. This graph is, is really just, when you're reading this graph, something I'd like you to sort of take a look at is, is, is with respect to this, is that pay attention to the red and the black, but only in the shaded box in the first month. So the red is the GA group, the black is the sham group, but in the gray box from B to one in the first month, you can see there's a huge difference between GA and sham. And then after that, the, GA, the sham group crossed over and you can see the sham group did after they crossed over similarly well as the GAE group in terms of their pain. In the WOMAC score, which is basically disability stiffness function, it was the same thing. The sham group did not see a statistically significant improvement in the first month, but once they crossed over the black line, then they saw significant improvements just like the GAE group. The purpose of this study, of course, like any study related to pain is that you have to prove that there's no placebo or sham effect from the procedure. So all of our sham patients actually underwent sedation, angiogram, selective catheterization of genicular arteries, but just injection of saline instead of beads. And so I think that was important for us. And this for us was a big benchmark to prove early on and probably something we should have done in other fields before. Um, for example, prostate embolization took almost 10 years between the time of the initial studies to actually get a sham study published. But I think here with the knee embolization, we're happy that we got this study very, very, very done very quickly and, uh, and safely. Um, these are the baseline versus one month data. If you look at GAE versus sham. And if you can see here, this the number you're seeing, VAS 50.1, that's the difference in improvement between GAE and sham. In the crossover arm, same thing, 38 points between the crossover and sham out of 100. So there's a significant improvement uh, in pain. In disability, one thing we found that was interesting actually is the GAE versus sham group, there, it was statistically significant, but in the crossover versus sham group, we did not find a statistically significant improvement. It was borderline significantly improvement. So it was trending towards significant, but it was not, if you use straight statistics, statistically, statistically significant. In terms of safety and complications, um, in the sham group, obviously there were no significant complications, but in the GAE group, uh, skin changes in three patients were the most common uh, findings we saw. Um, uh, knee pain, one patient had increase in knee pain, which lasts for a few days, uh, but was self-resolved. But nonetheless, you can see the safety profile of the procedure is very good. 
I do want to review some some genicular artery anatomy. Um, you know, I think we, you know, like every procedure we get involved in, uh, the genicular artery anatomy is something I think it's important to understand. Uh, obviously, in the setting of trauma, where most people might be might be treating uh, genicular arteries, or maybe in the setting of hemarthrosis, we're just really looking for the areas that are really blushing very strongly. Um, but I think it's important to identify these because some of these arteries can very easily be confused with muscular branches. And obviously you don't wanna be embolizing muscular tendinous junctions, for example, in the hamstring or quadricep musculature, or even in the gastrocnemius musculature. So I think understanding this anatomy and which branches are actually which is, is, is really important. So we're gonna start on the medial side here. And the first branch on the medial side is the descending genicular artery. And it splits like an inverted V. So the straight branch is usually, the straight branch is usually the saphenous branch and the curvilinear branch is usually the muscular articular branch. So the muscular articular branch, as you can see here on the right, usually supplies the superior medial aspect of the patella. And that's where it supplies pain uh, fibers to or vascularity to those pain fibers. But the straight branch, which, which terminates around the medial tibial, medial femoral condyle and medial tibial plateau, though that branch is generally the, the synovial branch that you'd like to target. Um, and there's an example of that right there. The superior medial branch, which I showed you before, the best way to identify this branch is it almost always arises right at the origin of the superior lateral branch. And both branches drape over the femoral condyle. So if you find a branch that's just above this, and if, for example, the branch here that's near my arrow opposite the descending genicular artery, that's a muscular, muscular branch. And it's often mistaken for the superior lateral branch because it tends to drape down over the lateral aspect of the knee. But you need the branches to drape over the femoral condyle. So this is a good way to identify the superior medial and actually also the superior lateral branch. But that's the superior medial genicular artery. In terms of the superior lateral, this is an example of that. Now, both branches here don't, don't arise exactly opposite each other, but adjacent to each other. But again, you'll see drapes over, in this particular case, the lateral femoral condyle. And here on the image that's in the center, anastomosis with the recurrent tibial artery, which arises off the, uh, sorry, anastomosis off the, with the inferior genicular artery on the lateral side. So this very clear anastomosis that you can see. And oftentimes one of these branches, superior inferior is usually the dominant branch. So this is the superior lateral, sorry, so yeah, superior, uh, sorry, superior medial, I'm sorry, I was referencing medial lateral. This is the superior medial genicular artery, but in this particular case, anastomosing with the inferior medial genicular artery. The inferior medial genicular artery, so this is the third of the medial branches. So descending genicular, descending, sorry, G, descending genicular, superior medial, which we covered, and this is the inferior medial. The inferior medial has usually this configuration, which is an inverted V. So it typically wraps around basically the metaphysis of the medial tibial plateau. It can appear horizontally, but more often than not, it usually has this J shape. So I think that's an important way to recognize this branch. If you start seeing straight branches that pass the metaphysis of the tibia, then you're really looking at sural or gastrocnemius branches. So to distinguish these two branches, you really want to see this branch have an upward turn right at that metaphysis. And so that's something that you should be looking for. Um, on the lateral side, so now we're on the lateral side. So superior lateral genicular branch here in the middle, you can see this picture showing how it's draping over the lateral femoral condyle. And you can see the blush that's occurring from this. You know, you will see early branches that occur off this, off this artery very commonly. And in that middle picture, right where that catheter is, just distal to the tip of the microcatheter, you actually see the branch to the, it's called the middle genicular artery, which is on the posterior aspect of the knee joint. We will always advance our microcatheter distal to that before doing an embolization. That branch, although in Okono studies was utilized to treat patients who have posterior knee pain, we've avoided embolizing that branch because it actually travels into the joint itself and has vascular supply to both the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. So we tend to advance our microcatheter distal to this and over the femoral condyle before, before uh, embolizing this branch. The inferior lateral genicular branch, unlike the inferior medial, tends to extend horizontal. So this branch tends to come horizontal, usually at or just above the knee joint. It rarely comes off below the knee joint, but it usually is at the joint space or just above. So this inferior lateral genicular artery tends to wrap around. You can imagine this artery comes from the popliteal fossa 
all the way around like this laterally and then wraps around to the anterior aspect of the knee joint. And if you inject it fairly strong, like we did here on the image on the right, you'll all of a sudden start to see it fill numerous collaterals from other genicular branches through this arcade. So that's the inferior medial genicular artery. The last branch that's on the lateral aspect, you'll see here off the AT. So off the proximal anterior tibial artery is an artery that goes completely retrograde and it is the recurrent tibial artery. And so that branch uh, that occurs off the AT uh, is what you'll see and extends up to the knee joint. Do not confuse that with the smaller branch that's just proximal to that. That branch actually is a, also a recurrent tibial artery, but it does not go to the synovium. So you want to see a branch that extends all the way up to the synovium from the AT. And so that's how to distinguish those two branches. Um, just to give you a little overview of what's going on in the GAE world, um, you know, there are 14 studies that are currently going on in various stages. Uh, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, they include uh, data with both embozine, hydropearl. Uh, our study on the randomized control study used uh, a resorbable embolic gel bead. Uh, um, so there are, multi, there are randomized control studies and there are sham studies uh, versus, and there's also comparisons with alternate therapies. Uh, interestingly, the United Kingdom study that's being performed right now is I couldn't find on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, but we are aware that's being performed with Embosphere. Um, uh, there are multiple single arm studies at multiple locations uh, that have currently been done that show at least safety and efficacy. Uh, we have leading indicators that mild to moderate OA may be better for GAE and the more severe patients uh, may not do as well. Uh, randomized data with respect to steroid injections is still needed. Uh, the sham data, like I mentioned, will be published very shortly. Um, uh, so I think we're looking forward to seeing that. I think for us, one of the biggest challenges, people always ask, you know, where this is, you know, where are we in terms of offering this in clinical practice? I will tell you in our setting, uh, obviously, because we're, we're very firm in our clinical research, we offer it primarily in the setting of clinical research. There are very rare cases that are done outside of clinical trial. Uh, but uh, in the setting of hemoarthrosis, it's obviously performed much more frequently. Uh, but to advance this, as a treatment, we're looking obviously to, to launch a robust multi-center clinical trial. Um, there is a, uh, a consensus, research consensus panel that is meeting uh, with the SIR, just to give you an idea, in just a couple of weeks. Um, I think it's the 28th and 29th of this month uh, to assess for what are the next steps for us as a society that we need to focus on in terms of grant funding and support from the society to move uh, this forward. Uh, but there are certain objectives we need to obtain. So whether it's embolic particle labeling um, and which patients should really be included uh, in the procedure to make sure that we're studying the right type of patients and then provide guidelines, right? On who should actually be treated uh, once we study this uh, a little bit better. Um, at present, we don't know what this recommendation will be. We're proposing recommendations of an RCT versus some standardized therapy, probably intra-articular intra -articular steroid injection. Uh, another sham study may not be necessarily necessary after our initial study because it was powered so well uh, and proved its point uh, substantially. Uh, but nonetheless, we will probably have recommendations with respect to that. And I think that's where we're going. Um, outside of the knee, it's really important to focus on the fact that embolization in the MSK realm, if you will, um, the knee is really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we did a clinical study on shoulder embolization and frozen shoulder uh, we're about to launch another study, which is larger uh, in a multi-center here in the DC area uh, uh, for shoulder embolization in the setting of frozen shoulder. Um, if you think patients and the results, uh, the patients are satisfied and the results are very good in the setting of the knee, the shoulder results are actually even more staggering because the degree of inflammation and angiogenesis in frozen shoulder is, is frankly more staggering. So um, in the shoulder, it's definitely the case. And there are other applications uh, whether muscular tendon is pain, uh, such as say uh, a tennis elbow, uh, but there are other indications. In my trip to Japan a number of years ago, I've seen cases done for back pain and sacroiliitis and a number of other conditions, plantar fasciitis, even in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis where patients may get some transient improvement in pain. But nonetheless, I think what's important to convey here is um, this is a future. This is not something that's probably gonna be figured out over the next 12 months or 18 months. Uh, but I think if you're looking at a three to five year plan, uh, this is something that will probably fall very well into the lap of most uh, practicing interventional radiologists. And like I mentioned, we will need larger comparative studies. If you look at orthopedic surgery literature, I would encourage you to do this. 
the guidelines for SIR, for example, for prostate embolization, which you know I helped author, are fairly robust. They are about, I don't know, 10 to 12 pages, which review, you know, uh, went through about 900 publications that narrowed it down to maybe 14 to 16 publications to review in detail. It's still only about 12 pages. The position statement from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons with respect to knee replacement is over 600 pages. So if we want to have a place in the orthopedic world, this is not just can IRs do knee embolization because you know all we need is a few people to not really like knee embolization. Orthopedic surgeons will be very against it as a society, and that's what we don't want, similar to what happened in the urologic societies with PAE. So I think that there is a, a long-term play here that we need with multiple larger studies. The last thing, which I think is, is probably most important for all musculoskeletal applications is we really need to better understand this role. For those of you who are involved in, in more bench and preclinical research, if you are, um, this is something that I would encourage you to do. If you're looking for a focus of research, looking at how um, cytokines are affected with respect to uh, embolization and in the setting of uh, osteoarthritis models or inflammatory arthritis models, that is something that I think will probably better help us understand which patients to treat, what we're actually doing, not just say deadening nerve like many orthopedic surgeons think we're doing. Um, but I think it'll really give us a better underlying uh, uh, explanation for our hypothesis more than what we probably already have now. So that role of angiogenesis, which I think is interesting because I've seen it myself now in a multiple clinical trials with respect to knee and a clinical trial with respect to shoulder. Uh, having not seen it myself, I wouldn't believe it, but it's, it's substantial. But I think understanding how we affect that role besides just a mechanical obstruction from a, uh, from a, uh, a chemical standpoint or a physiologic standpoint, that's something we really need to do better at. And I think uh, uh, our society and, and, and the IRs like yourself who are out there doing this type of research, that's something that we really should focus on because it's going to advance the field beyond just our efficacy of doing a procedure is, is really valuable. Uh, with that, you know, I'd like to end the slideshow. Thank you guys. I know you have to listen to about 40 minutes of me speaking. I want to leave some time for you guys to ask some questions. Uh, and and uh, I'll turn it over back to you guys uh, to sort of lead the way here in moderating uh, what questions you guys might have. Sure. Thanks, Cindy. That was, that was a great talk. Um, there, uh, we do have a, a handful of questions. I think some of these you did speak to in your talk, but I'll at least kind of ask them just in case they were missed um, by... Uh, uh, by by any of the the attendees. Yeah, sure. Um, the um, so uh, uh, first question. Uh, this is actually from one of my partners at at Temple. Uh, his uh, his name is Pratik Patel. He actually um, does pretty much all of our GAEs. Um, and his question is: uh, We've done about thirty to forty GAEs in the past year, and have noticed uh, that severe OA. Um, uh, patient scores with uh, Kelgren Lawrence of three to four almost have no response. Do you offer GAE to this subgroup of patients who have no other option, i.e., not surgical candidates or tried physical supplementation, physical therapy, et cetera? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Yeah, I would say that in the grade four group, I would not, even in those patients who really don't have other options. I know that in IR, we're commonly, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot, you know, no one has an option, let's just offer this, right? And then, but I think. There's an old line in IR, right? Just because someone's going to die doesn't mean you have to carry them to their grave. And I think, I, I think if you want to have good outcomes, I would avoid the Kellerman four patients. In the three patients, I, you know, I find that somewhat interesting. I mean, maybe there's some overlap. Obviously, Pratik's asking this question because they're just a, you know, to get a better understanding. You know, and you guys obviously have a good experience already doing this procedure. But I think in the grade three, what I would look to is, are we getting to all the arteries that are on that side? One thing I've noticed, you know, and having traveled around and been to different sites who are doing GAE is, and even some of the clinical trial sites is what they're typically doing, and you could probably speak to this too, or Pratika too, but maybe they, they're they not necessarily targeting all the vessels on that side. And interrogating all the arteries is important because I can tell you, having spoken to the folks in, U, in the UK, they were, you know, initially at least, and that may have changed, but targeting one artery excuse me, on that side. And I think getting all the three arteries, at least in terms of subselective angiography to make sure that they don't have a supply is probably really important. But I, so in the Kellerman three group, I would try. I think it's 
and maybe work on some tech technique related issues that might help. And, and the other last thing is, you know, there's other things that go into it, as you guys can imagine, right? There's bead selection, there's, you know, how good is the embolization itself? Um, there's other factors to it, right? And, and the degree of inflammation. And that might assess sort of, is, there was another question with respect to MRI on all your patients. You know, I like the MRI in terms of synovitis. You know, we're, we uh, wrote a paper just on synovitis scoring and MRI and predictive uh, information. This was actually, this has been shown very well, MRI to predict localized pain and tenderness with respect to synovitis. So if you identify synovitis on an MRI, the patient is likely to have pain in that area. So I like getting the MRI in all these patients, um, you know, and really focusing on that. I don't, uh, you know, the follow-up to that question that was also asked, which is if they have contralateral hypervascularity or angiogenesis, I don't treat it. So if there are people who have vascularity in other areas, is I look at it almost like it could just be burnt out. You know, the, infl the inflammatory stage of it might be gone. They don't have pain. I avoid it because over embolizing, like, you know, treating four or five vessels at a time is going to lead to a lot of pain. You know, and anybody who's done this where they've gone after four or five vessels, even in chemoarthrosis patients, the patients have a good amount of pain for a few weeks and it's pretty memorable and, and you're really not giving them any, any functional benefits. So I tend to avoid that. Okay, great. Um, and the, um, the, the other question was, I think you did mention this, I thought you said 75, but um, what size particles are you using? Uh, would you consider converting to Promaxim in patients who have not responded to their first GAE with particles? Yeah, so I, I stick with um, beads that are between 100 and 300 in size. So I'll either use one or an embosine. Um, I'll use one to 300 gel bead. Those are probably my two. And frankly, because those are the ones we did clinical studies on. So I feel at least comfortable that the clinical results were, were, uh, were good with those studies. 75 size particles, either embosine or hydropearl, I would use in the shoulder because again, that's what we did studies with. But um, converting to Primaxin, I don't really think it would serve a benefit. Primaxin probably acts most closely to a 40 to 60 or 40 to 75 micron particle. If you look at it under a microscope, that's about the size that it really acts at because it's like it's a salt basically. And it acts as that as that size particle. I don't know that if you're using 100 micron particles, first of all, if you've done that and then follow up a primaxin, you probably already have permanent embolic there. So you're probably not getting much benefit. But I would, I don't really, I wouldn't see the benefit to doing that. The other way around, I might argue, might be beneficial, but um, I tend to avoid that. The other reason we avoid primaxin and not in this setting with repeats, but or non-responders, but is because there's a significant in the US, you know, allergy to penicillin and cephalosporin. So we tend to stay away from it because it would exclude, you know, about 10% of the American population from even having the procedure. So we tend to want to use embolics because of that reason, but uh, I'm not against Primaxin. It does take some savviness to mixing. Uh, as you draw it up and mix, uh, you know, for those of you who are used to the magnetic mixers, for example, or agitators, uh, I would suggest having one of those on hand because keeping Primaxin suspended as a particulate is not easy. So uh, mixing a bead comparatively, even it, it, it over dilution and can sometimes be annoying. Primaxin is very annoying to keep mixed. So, um, and oftentimes you end up, you end up injecting just contrast and not even much Primaxin at all, but yeah. Okay. Um, next question. How do you recruit patients? Again, you kind of spoke to you do this in a clinical trial setting, but how do you recruit patients? How satisfied are the patients with the results? Do they seek additional treatment after uh, GAE or, or is GAE the final treatment for most? Yeah. So for most, it's a final treatment. We, if they fail a GAE for us, because we, as of now, we will only recruit patients from orthopedic surgeons. Um, again, I, we don't want to create this mad rush of patients where we offer something and this becomes like an old CCSVI kind of thing where people with MS are getting unnecessary angioplasty. I think there's so much to learn that I just, you know, personally, part of it's reputational and part of it's responsibility, I think, for the whole procedure itself is if we start recruiting, you know, because it's very easy to recruit these patients from our varicose vein population, our primary cares, et cetera, physical therapy. But I think that if we don't work with orthopedics on this, we're not going to really get good long-term buy-in. So that's how we recruit for our clinical trials. 
And the patients who come to us for hemoarthrosis also come to orthopedics. If a patient comes from primary care, we will make them see their orthopedic surgeon and get on the phone with them and talk to them about it and make sure that, that, that they're uh, comfortable with the procedure. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on cooled RFA of genicular nerves uh, for osteoarthritis? And could there be a synergistic effect with GAE given the different mechanisms of action? Yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting, you know, for the for, uh, genicular nerve ablation, I, I think it works. Having done some, I think it definitely works. I think it's a little bit challenging to identify all of the uh, uh, actual target uh, nerves. Uh, I'm not so wor much worried about artery injury. Um, they don't always run parallel, but there is some degree of par parallel nature of the nerves that are involved, but they don't have to. And we know that from the literature that exists already, but suffice it to say, so much is dependent on location of the probe for ablation that uh, small increments of, of error uh, lead to a poor result. The other thing that I don't really like about it is because it's not, um, I would say, well calibrated right now for the type of Wallerian degeneration that we need to achieve with respect to nerves, the, the result is that pain comes back relatively quickly. So after about three to six months, pain's back. And I think that might be more of a function of the technology and some shortcomings that may be better uh, addressed uh, in future. I'm aware of there's certain technologies with respect to cryo and RF that are coming out that are probably that are probably better suited uh, for a longer term result. Uh, so I think it is a, a technology that will not go away. Um, but I, I don't think there's long long term results are durable enough for me to say it's a better option than GA from at least my experience in a well selected patient. Got it. Okay. Um, again, I think you touched on this a little bit, at least with the more severe cases, but in which group of patients with, with OA is the procedure, uh, uh, gets the best result? Yeah. In which group? Yeah. I would say the group one to two. I mean, if I were to assess a perfect patient, I would look at a patient and say this, are you between the age of 40 and 60? It's a little early to get a knee replacement. You, you, you don't, the orthopedic surgeons do not want to do knee replacements in these patients anyways. And and, and when, you, when you look at this patient population, there's an opportunity, right? Because they're early on, they're going to have inflammation, they're going to have synovitis. But on top of that, you want to assess patients who have palpable tenderness. If I ask a patient, can you point to the area in your pain that hurts? And if you press on it, that area, does it hurt? And in addition, if I press on it, do I feel an area of synovial thickening? It is very easy to feel that synovium that's thickened. If those things all line up, I'll, say, I'll accept that patient for treatment. If, if a patient of mine says, oh, my whole knee hurts, it hurts in the rain, you know, it's stiff all the time, and I'm not treating them. And the, re the reality is, um, you know, I think that if you're, if, if you're going to treat these people who don't have palpable tenderness, then you're really probably treating burned out synovitis. And frankly, that might be this Kelligan 3 4 patients who people are, may not be having the greatest experience in is patients aren't really... And we all know what patients are like, right? When they come in, they're all, at first they're like, oh, my whole knee hurts. When I walk, it hurts. When I do this, it hurts. But you really want people to have focal pain because you're offering a focal treatment, right? We're not offering a whole knee treatment. And so I think, and by the way, the other thing we're not offering is we're not offering a treatment which improves stability, which is the other thing. So patients who have primary pain related to stability or instability, I don't treat them either. So there's a lot of patients who can exclude just based on that. When patients say, oh, my knee clicks and every time it locks up, it hurts and it feels bad when it locks. And I'm like, well, that's, that's a stability issue. You know, you probably have a meniscal injury that's not degenerative, that may need repair or debridement, or you probably have, you're probably at the point where you, you know, you may have loose bodies and you need arthroscopy or you might need a knee replacement. So I think steering those patients in the right direction is much better than doing this procedure. Because I will tell you, just, you know, there have been only there have been less than a thousand cases of GA you probably performed in the world for the setting of osteoarthritis. And there are less than 200 of those cases published, okay? Of which less than 60 of them are actually done in well-controlled clinical studies. So if you take these 60 to 200 patients, the number of reported adverse events is probably so underreported. 
and the variety and uh, uh, degree of variability with respect to technique is so variable. And I've seen it myself in talking to other people who do this procedure. People send me pictures and I'm like, this is so different than how we do the procedure. Not to say ours is right, but you know, we've been doing GA in the setting of bleeding for over 10 years, 13 years. And so there's so much variability that I think um, you know, I would, I would really focus on a, such a small subset of patients to make sure you get really good success. Okay. Um, another question was mainly talking about uh, equipment. So if you have, um, I guess, maybe to speak to uh, which geniculars do you find kind of the hardest to catheterize and are you, are you basically kind of just floating your, your micro down there with a, you know, curved tip micro wire? Or are you engaging with the guide cath and, you know, kind of what are your go-tos? Yeah. So I tend to use a, a, a sheet and a, ca a micro catheter. I don't use a base catheter, but so I tend to use a 70 centimeter, you know, to room or cook sheath. I think it's cook because they make a 70 cm sheath. And what's good about a 70 length is it ends up in the mid to distal SFA right at the adductor canal. So you don't have a lot hanging out of the body. Or a 90, which we use for PVD, you know, infrapopoteal infra PVD is a little bit too long. And then we'll use a 130 microcatheter. Like I said, a 2.4, we tend to use a prograde, but, you know, or, or a direction. But I mean, they're all, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, from that standpoint, it's what you guys are comfortable with. And then from a, from a micro wire, which I think is frankly the most important, you know, we have some favorites. I mean, I, I tend to use an 014 Transcend, which I know Transcend's got a big hit after fibroid embolization, but. The 014 transcends are very good because they have a lot of distal support because micro wires that have too floppy of a distal tip, uh, for example, like I use a double angle GT every day, for example, uh, in PA or every other day or whatever. And I can tell you that that three centimeter floppy tip is not strong enough to support your micro catheter getting into a superior medial or lateral genicular artery. It may help advance the catheter once you're in it, but as far as getting into it, I find that because you're selecting a small vessel from a larger parent vessel, it's very challenging. You need a, you need a micro, micro wire with good support. So if you're going to use a micro wire that you can make a larger curve on that has a flexible distal tip, but it's not floppy, I would tend to stick with an 014 transcend or there's an Asahi wire that we like that we use, the Meister wire, we use it in, in, in PA. Uh, uh, honestly, that probably is, that has become over the last, I would say, six to eight months, where we probably do about you know ten to fifteen embolizations a week, that becomes our our probably first pull go to wire. But those two wires, I would say, have a similar type of structure in the sense that they don't have this floppy tip. You can shape them to a wider curve, which which helps because you need a wire that scrapes along the surface of the popliteal artery, right? I mean, so but typically, it's sheath microcatheter base catheter, sorry, my, sheath microcatheter. If you are someone who needs a TUI or a flow switch to keep the microcatheter from going back and forth, because that can be very frustrating for certain users, is like you get the microcatheter in place, you hook up a 3cc syringe, you inject, and then because it's not being clamped down by a TUI, then the catheter can bounce back or when you pull the wire, it can slip back, uh, which is frustrating for all of us. If that's the case, then I would suggest use a sheath which has a TUI attached to it, you know, instead of like a, a simple check valve or use a base catheter. But I don't find the base catheter itself to be that helpful. Okay. Yeah, I know we um, switched to the Asahi wire a few months back and, and I know that made things a little bit easier as well. Um, the, I think I know the answer to this one is because of the collateralization that you were showing, but uh, any utilization for microcoils? Yeah, so we don't, um, you know, we have seen pretty fairly large collaterals um, to other branches, but honestly, in that case, because of the volume, you guys probably know this, but from the volume of embolic you're injecting, it's so little that, and you're doing it so slow in these small increments. Like I said earlier, we inject 0.2 cc's at a time, which basically doesn't even come out the end of the microcatheter. And then we flush it through slowly, then re-image, then 0.2, then re-image. And the point is, we don't end up really worrying about collateral. So coiling, we haven't addressed, haven't done. And I certainly would not coil the main genicular arteries. Um, as you guys probably already know, if people develop PVD, genicular arteries can supply, can be the main source of femoral to popliteal uh, anastomoses. And so I, I don't, I wouldn't coil them off for that reason as well. Okay. Um, still have a few more to get here. Um, people, uh, 
I have a lot of thoughts. That's, that's a good thing. Right. Um, could you please comment on your outlook for insurance coverage in 2021, private uh, Medicare? Yeah, it's not there. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who uh, we have looked at this, by the way, and, and I've done this for other procedures that we've sort of evolved over the years, is there is no policy right now for Medicare. It depends on what district you're in and the, you know, the districts around the US, but there is no policy that I'm aware of for any Medicare district. And you might get paid now, but it's going to be worse if they come take their money back. So I would not advise, but that's just my personal advice, uh, doing it in that setting, um, primarily because it, there's not really a policy uh, in favor of it. But even in settings where there's not a policy against it and people do it because it's standard of care, it hasn't really become standard of care. So you can justify doing something under Medicare if something's become standard of care and there's still no LCD to to be against it or for it because it's well-established in some guidance document. In this setting, there's no guidance document that supports its use. So I think you're probably out on a limb. From a private payer standpoint, you're, from my understanding, you will not get reimbursed except in the setting of hemarthrosis. And it's a different code anyways. But the point is, I, would, I think this, the landscape for 2021 is not one that I would probably focus on. I think in, by... In an ideal world, by the end of 2022, by the ideal world, but that's going to take some significant lobbying, a lot of letters to insurance companies. You know, one thing, by the way, and I take this opportunity every time I speak to anybody where there's a group of more than five people is, and nobody likes to do this, but it's the truth. Uh, write letters to insurance companies. If you, they make a difference. If you, if you are someone who wants to do GAE, and you think that it's valuable, or PAE is actually the same because there are some insurance companies. And I know this in the Northeast, for example, like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Pennsylvania does not pay for PAE, for example. You write the insurance company. They have standard emails for reviewing policies. Just say you want the policy, re-review current data, send them the SIR guidance document. They'll review it. And, and to my surprise, th things change. I mean, we just got it overturned in, in another state just by simply writing emails. So I think that the landscape is probably not favorable for 2020, but uh, that doesn't mean that there should not be an effort that's done or research that's done. Okay. Um, do you recommend a limit to how many geniculated arteries you will embolize at the same in the same session, say for bicompartmental OA? Yeah, I generally use three. Um, you know, I think that I think that three is probably um, for me um, the 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 limit. I think after that, you know, you end up getting. Um, uh, too much pain and discomfort. And frankly, you just, you, you want to get, you know, you want to get a good result. So I think that's, that's really uh, uh, what's, what's, in, what's important. Um, and have orthopedic surgeons asked you if bone stock is affected uh, regarding future total knee replacement? Um, what's your preferred uh, right now? I'm sorry, what was that? I, I missed the end of that. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to say that too. So um, I, I guess um, have orthopedic surgeons asked you if bone stock is affected regarding future total knee replacement? Of course, yeah. No, they definitely asked. We have not seen any changes from that. Uh, in our MRI paper, we're going to publish, there were two cases of transient bone marrow edema. Neither of them went on to lead to bone infarcts. Uh, in the Okuno study, as I mentioned earlier, there were two-year outcomes with no changes in bone or you know uh, uh, any other soft tissue changes or cartilage. So um, I, I address it like that. See, there's no evidence to show that there is. I mean, you know, I've seen patients go for synovectomy after a failed embolization for hemoarthrosis. I've seen them go for a knee replacement, just like in these other studies, as you've seen uh, from Landers, for example, after GAE, there's been no reported complications of it afterwards. Okay. Um, any role for this uh, in children with chronic changes from hemophilia? Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I saw that I saw that question from Anne Marie. I haven't seen her in a long time. Actually, actually, last time I came to Philly Andrews Society, I saw her there. So, and I think that's a really, it's a great question. I, you know, um, in hemophiliacs, and actually, I, I did a patient recently who had who had uh, GI bleeding from a malformation who had uh, hemophilia. But I can tell you that in these patients, of course, and you guys know this already, and I'm sure she's very, she knows this very frequently because she probably deals with this all the time. In patients who get the you know corrective factors so they can get an angiography, I I think there actually might be a role because many of these patients who have hemophilia don't just have um, hemarthrosis. 
they have chronic synovial thickening because they're getting this repeatedly. And so I, I think this is something very, uh, uh, very worth studying, not just in the hemophiliac po population, but there is a, you know, obviously that affects children, you know, more frequently because it presents earlier, but in the other populations of patients who have bleeding disorders like von Willebrand disease, we did a patient actually not too long ago who has that as well, who needed to be on chronic antiplatelet therapy. So there are many conditions in which they're getting, you know, subclinical episodes of bleeding. Hemophiliacs, of course, are getting, you know, profound episodes, but in these patients who even get subclinical episodes of bleeding, they are experiencing a good degree of synovitis. And I, and I think this is a good population to look at. So, um, uh, you know, Anne-Marie, like we've talked about in the past, you know, children are just little adults, right? I'm kidding. So they, they are a good population to study. And so if you need any help, you can tell Anne-Marie, I'll come up to Philadelphia to help. I'll, I'll let Anne know. <laughs> um, the, um, and then uh, finally, um, what sort of options do patients pursue if they do not experience pain relief following GAE or have pain recurrence after several months? Uh, so I guess like when, when's your trigger for as far as repeat embolization, um, or would you maybe say, ah, I'm not going to repeat that, you know, we'll, we'll you know, do some other uh, management option. Yeah, I would consider it after a year. I mean, if somebody fails under a year, to me, for the cost of the procedure, albeit the risk is low, um, I mean, truthfully, the cost of the procedure is not cheap, right? I mean, from a disposable standpoint, it's very cheap, right? But from an overall overhead standpoint to insurance companies, it's fairly expensive. And I, and I feel like, it means, of course, it's not the cost of knee replacement and physical therapy and rehab, et cetera, and downtime, loss of work and everything else. There's, there's really no, you know, I would say significant social impact on the patient, which is important. But from a, uh, a perspective of if I'm going to repeat it, I'd like to see them do well for 12 months. And that it's only personal. If that's my personal opinion, you know, based on, I just don't want to offer it and say, hey, come back in six months, because then I might as well be offering them a knee injection, which, which frankly does work for about three months. And if people are getting it Q3 months and getting Synvisc, and maybe part of it's a placebo effect, part of it's a real effect, I don't really want to, uh, 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 you know what I mean, contribute to them having repeated procedures for no reason. Sure, sure. Um, and I think that wraps up all, all the questions. Um, Sandeep, that was, this was awesome. It's a great talk, uh, great discussion afterwards as well. Um, thank you for spending an hour of your evening with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, to everybody else, that, that's um, uh, to all the attendees, uh, our next meeting, uh, we don't have the exact date nailed down right now, but it'll be either the first or second week of February, uh, it'll be on Venus Interventions. I look forward to seeing you there. And again, uh, thanks, Cindy, for, uh, for joining us for this evening. Hey, anytime. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Thanks a lot. See you, everyone.